Hello everybody and welcome to this final recording of our GUR working group meeting about mathematical optimization and quantum computing. We hope you had fun watching our videos. As I said, this will be the last one from the series and in this episode you will watch the presentation by Martin Leib. So now I see so 115 and I would like to start our next session. You're very welcome again here. And uh, we uh, have in this session two last talks with a little break in between. And I'm very pleased to introduce you uh, our first speaker, Martin Leib. He studied theoretical physics at the University of Constance and finished his PhD at the University of Munich on the theory of superconducting qubits. Um, after his PhD, he held three uh, postdoc positions in Japan, Scotland, and uh, Austria. And now he is employed at the Volkswagen Data Lab um, uh, and responsible for the development and research of quantum uses case for the Volkswagen Group. So Martin, you are very welcome to start. Yeah, um, thank you for the introduction and um, thank you to the organizers for organizing this nice conference and inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a application that we identified in our production um, that we are targeting with a, um, a quantum algorithm for gate-based quantum computers uh, that you already heard of um, numerous times now in this in this conference, which is um, QAOA. First of all, um, I need to progress. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, first of all, I would like to um, sketch a little bit an overview of quantum algorithms and um, try to motivate why we specifically chose um, this algorithm and this uh, use case. Um, there, there are two main types of quantum speedup. There's this exponential speedup and the polynomial speedup. And um, given the limited uh, resources that we are currently have at our disposal, we rather opt for an exponential speedup. And so the typical uh, thing that you can have or um, have an exponential speedup is, is this um, factoring of large numbers. And um, if you're not a Bond villain and you're really uh, interested in progressing humankind, you could take actually a, um, a sub algorithm of this factoring algorithm, which is quantum phase estimation and do some quantum simulation. So this is interesting for the pharma and chemistry industry where they really can um, speed up their research cycles if they can simulate larger molecules. Another thing that has might uh, profit from an exponential speedup is um, a quantum algebra or in general matrix algebra and um, solving of linear systems and stuff like that. Um, on the other side, you have this polynomial speedup and the paradigmatic example for a polynomial speedup is this Grover search algorithm. And uh, the application in this case is just identifying a, a marked element in an unordered database. And you typically say, okay, this is not a use case I'm interested in. I'm only searching through ordered databases. And, but think of it that way. So this um, fill a database with all the possible um, configurations to a combinatorial optimization problem and you're interested in finding the single element that um, optimizes this combinatorial optimization problem. And then you are um, at basically at something which we think it is at the core business of uh, the VW group. So this is where they, they most profit from. Unfortunately, if you are really interested in the optimal solution to that problem, we are very likely to end up only with a polynomial speedup. So, and that is why we are looking actually at um, alternative ways. So we are looking at actually approximate optimization because there it is believed that we might get something more than polynomial speedup. And I'm going to show you that this is, that we, yeah, to some extent even can show that we have a speedup that is more than polynomial. Um, another thing to uh, consider when um, searching for 
um, a suitable um, quantum algorithm for your application is that we are currently dealing with uh, NISC hardware and this so noisy intermediate scale quantum hardware, which means that we have QPUs with a small number of qubits, 10 to 100 currently. And these qubits are uh, non-error corrected and um, prone to, to errors. So basically all these algorithms that I've shown you a slide before cannot really execute, cannot really be executed on this hardware. And um, because of this, um, we, we opt for, for alternatives, so heuristics. And um, because of this, this um, finite lifetime, I say, so for, for these, these quantum, uh, for these qubits, we um, are searching for algorithms that um, have a constant time and so constant time irrespective of the size. And so these, these kind of algorithms are typically heuristics. And um, I'm going to explain this later a little bit more in detail. So they are um, hybrid quantum classical heuristics. So you have some um, quantum accelerator that is communicating with a classical computing unit. And in this communication, you basically come up with a good solution to your problem. The, the, the problem with these heuristics is that they have um, typically don't have any provable speed up. So you can just execute that. And typically on state of the art hardware, that is the, the result is, is kind of disappointing. I'm going to show you this uh, on a later slide. And, um, but we need to, to convince our management that this is still worth uh, pursuing. So um, it would be nice to have one of these uh, NISC or um, constant time algorithms with some perspective that we can say, okay, starting um, with this number of qubits and um, this uh, time that they can execute an algorithm without an error, we do get some, some speed up over um, classic algorithms. And that would be the next item on our wish list, what a application together with a quantum algorithm should fulfill. And all of these things to um, some extent are um, fulfilled in this binary pension problem that we tackled with QA away. Um, now for um, the problem definition. So consider the, the following situation. So you have a, a paint job and your job is to paint cars. And each car needs to be painted with two colors. So can consider the following situation. So do you have a, a fender that is colored, uh, that is painted in, in red and a body that is painted in blue. So it actually doesn't matter which color you paint the car first. You could start with red, you could start with blue. And, but the second time you paint the car, you have to paint with the other color. And now your paint job only has one um, set of, um, of uh, paint robots. And um, if you want to change the color, um, you have to flush out the old color, uh, flush in the new color, um, clean the nozzles. So all of these um, colored, so a color change costs time and costs money and um, pollutes the, the environment. So now it, we have the following situation. So you, you get a sequence of cars and this sequence of cars is random and you need to paint them one by one uh, going through the paint shop. And um, as I said before, you want to minimize the number of color changes and the thing and, and the trick you can play to minimize this, this um, number of color changes is to choose which color to paint the car first. And um, so this is one possible sequence on how you could paint these cars. So you start with red, you change when it's necessary, because here you have the second appearance of this um, bully, and it has already been painted with red, so you need to change to blue, and then you go with blue. And you already see this sequence is optimal because you have at least one color change because um, you need to color, uh, you need to paint each car in these two colors. Now, by now, I hopefully have convinced you that 
um, the VW group should be interested in this problem. So why are we as uh, quantum algorithm researchers interested in that? And the interesting thing is um, this problem is actually known to be NP-hard. So it's um, um, difficult to come up with the optimal solution of this, this problem. And if you were to target the optimal solution with a quantum algorithm, you would end up, as I said before, with a polynomial speed up, or very likely only with a polynomial speed up. And because of this, as I said before, we are interested actually in, proximate, in approximation to this, to this um, problem. And th this is another very interesting complexity result for this problem. This problem is actually um, difficult to approximate. And, um, and it's in this, call, in this class called APX hard. What this means is that it's NP hard to come up with a solution to this problem with a performance guarantee. And the performance guarantee would look like um, you do get a solution that is never worse than some number times the optimal number of color changes. And this, again, irrespective of the, the prefactor, is known to be um, NP hard. Now, um, what have we done? So um, basically what we can show is that um, QAOA out of the box um, optimization algorithm can beat with in a fixed time um, heuristics that have been specifically developed for this um, task. And these heuristics all have polynomial uh, runtime and we can beat that with a constant time QAOA algorithm. And so the, the specific heuristics we are looking at is, for example, the red first heuristic. And that is a very simple, simple thing. So you just, um, every time a car enters the first time uh, this paint job, you paint it in red. And the second time it, it uh, enters the paint job, you paint it in blue. Now the average performance of this um, heuristic is um, you get two over three color changes per car. And the runtime is, of course, just linear. Now, the greedy algorithm is um, one step more sophisticated than that. So you would, and this is what you've seen before, you would change the color only when necessary. So this means when a car enters the second time in your paint shop, you change um, the color if you haven't changed already um that the color that you painted the car first and now you can prove actually that the average performance of this algorithm is um, half of a color change per car and the runtime is roughly um, polynomial in the in the size and now the, the 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 most complicated of this of these heuristics is the greedy recursive algorithm, which um, I'm not going to into detail what it exa exactly does. It, it's, it identifies in, a, in an intelligent way subsequences and solves these subsequences optimum. And you can show that the average performance in this case is two over five color changes per car. Now, um, the next thing is um, I, I'm going to tell you um, how we come up with this QAOA algorithm and how we can actually um, find out the average performance of this QAOA algorithm. And the first step, um, and you've seen this numerous times now, is to translate um, this um, combinatorial optimization problem to a universal language that can be understood by, for example, uh, quantum annealer or also um, QAOA, the quantum approximate optimization of algorithm. So um, typically um, for um for, for my the, the speakers that preceded me um they were talking about uh, the cubos and so my background is physics and I'm, I'm talking about the spin glass representation but this is basically the same thing and so what is a spin glass a spin, a spin glass a spin glass is a collection of binary variables and um so they could be uh, in states one or zero or um, if you are a physicist, it could be in spin pointing up or down. And um, in addition to this collection of binary variables, you have rules involving pairs of these variables. And now the rules could um, basically come, for, for this specific case, come in two flavors. You have a ferromagnetic and an antiferromagnetic rule. 
and these rules basically go, go like follows. So if you have a Faraday magnetic rule, that means if um, the involved two binary variables are in the same state, so either one, one, or if you are a physicist um, pointing up, pointing up, you don't have to pay any energy cost. But if they are in opposing states, so one, zero, or zero, one, or up, down, down, up, um, you have to pay a defined cost x. And now the solution to this um, spin glass is an assignment of the variables such that the sum of these energy costs is minimized. And this is known to be an NP-hard problem. And because of this, we can actually map every other combinatorial or every other NP-hard problem to this specific problem. And what is also nice, we can actually um, get a a visualization of this, this problem and um, gain some knowledge or, or insight by that. So um, you could think of the spin glass as a graph in the following sense. So you can um, have a, a graph and every node in this graph is actually one of these binary variables. And you have, if you have a um, rule that involves two of these binary variables, you would add an edge to this graph. And now, as I said, this is the common language. Basically, if you want to um, solve your problem for on a quantum anina or QAOE. Um, so how are we coming up with a um, spin glass representation of our problem? So first, we introduce a binary variable for every car. And we say, OK, if, bin if this binary variable is uh, 1 or the spin is pointing down, we start. Uh, painting the car with red. And if it's pointing up or uh, the binary variable is one, no, I said that already, or the other, <laughs> the other value, um, then we start uh, painting the car in blue. And the other um, appearance of the car is, um, is fixed by that. So if we start painting with blue, we have to paint with red the second time. Now, um, the next thing we need to find is, um, the rules. And um, to find the rules, we just go through the sequence of um, these cars. And OK, so we have these two cars, car A and car C. And we want to associate a unit cost to a, a color change between them. So um, we don't want any cost if these, these two are painted in the same color. As this would be if the associated uh, binary variables are either 1, 1 or 0, 0 but we want to associate a cost if um, there is a color change. So if it's in 0, 1 or 1, 0. And that is uh, a ferromagnetic interaction. And in the, in the language of, of spin glasses, that is basically an interaction um, with a prefactor minus 1. And um, with this, we can actually progress through um, the sequence of cars. So the next uh, neighboring set of cars is C and B. And again, here, if we want to penalize a color change, we introduce a ferromagnetic interaction. Now, the first deviation from this rule appears actually when we have um, two cars next to each other. And one of these cars actually appears the second time. So you see the, the beetle here appears the first time and the bully the second time. Now, as I said before, the, these binary variables encode actually um, the, the color we paint these cars when they appear the first time. So if we want to penalize now a color change between this car D and B, we have to um, implement an antiferromagnetic interaction. So this would be a plus one in the spin glass language. And with this, we basically go um, progress through the sequence again. If two cars are next to each other and both of them appear the, the, as the second time, Again, we can implement a ferromagnetic interaction for that. And um, OK, we go through that, and we come up with a spin glass representation of our binary paint job um, problem. Now, um, with this procedure, we basically end up with a spin glass, uh, which is on a graph of average degree 4. And every node is, the degree of every node is upper bounded by 4. We um, have spin glasses with twice as many ferromagnetic interactions as interferomagnetic interactions. And then we did actually some, a couple of sanity checks. So um, um, the, 
there, there are efficient algorithms for planar um, spin glasses. And so that's why we checked if our spin glasses are actually planar. And they start to be not planar from uh, roughly 20 cars. So this gives us a feeling when does this problem start to getting really um, hard. Another proxy for complexity is actually the tree width of these um, spin glasses or the graphs of these spin, spin glasses. And because every combinatorial optimization problem actually does not scale exponentially in the number of variables, but exponentially in the tree width of this um, of the underlying graphs. And again, here we can sh show that um, the tree width grows linearly. So this, this problem is still com complicated and we, we um, have to correct mapping here. Um, now for the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So um, to set up a quantum approximate optimization algorithm, you associate each and every um, binary variable in your um, optimization problem with a um, qubit. And then you initialize with this um, set of Hadamard gates, the, the qubit register in a superposition of all possible computational basis states. So a superposition of all possible, um, possible classical uh, combinations of these um, bits. And now the QAO algorithm is actually a collection of these blocks. Huh? And um, so one of these block would be this, so gamma one, gamma uh, beta, beta one, and another block would be gamma two, beta two. And the following, I'm going to refer to these because uh, for QAO, you can actually have a, um, a different number of blocks. And I'm going to, to um, say in the following, um, the level one QAO algorithm is basically a QAO algorithm with one of these blocks. Uh, the two is a QA way algorithm with two of these blocks and so further and so on. And now every one, every, every one of these blocks actually is organized in two subblocks. And the first subblock here is um, it does the following. So it it um, addresses pairs of qubits that are coupled by ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic interaction and does a joint rotation. Um, Let's say for ferromagnetic, it rotates, it rotates the two qubits in clockwise direction, and antiferromagnetic, it rotates the qubit in anti-clockwise uh, direction by a angle, which is which is a variation and parameter by angle gamma. Followed by uh, and you're following this block with the with another subblock, which is um, a individual rotation of every qubit. Um, again, by a angle beta um, with a, um, in a plane perpendicular actually to, to uh, the rotation plane that you used before. And again, this, the, the, the angle is a variation in parameter. I'm going to explain that later what this actually means. So, um, so by now this, this must look for someone who hasn't seen this already, a little bit like magic, but it's actually, it has a good reason why we're doing this, is this like that. So the QAOA algorithm is some kind of spectroscopic version of quantum annealing. So for quantum annealing, you have this smooth transformation of one, um, one landscape or one um, Hamiltonian to another. And in QAOA, you basically have this rapid transformation between two landscapes. Uh, and you can show that um, if you play some tricks, this can actually be superior to quantum annealing. And so what are the tricks that we're playing? So um, this is, so QAO is a, is a standard um, um, example of one of these hybrid quantum classic algorithms. And the, the common theme is always you have some, some uh, quantum circuit which is parameterized by classical parameters. And you execute this circuit and you calculate from, from the measurement results, you calculate some loss function and you use some, some um, outer loop optimizer, which is classical to optimize the parameters according to this, to this um, loss function. And that is exactly the same as you would do training a neural network, for example. And, and indeed, so for some of our projects, we're using uh, a gradient 
um, free optimizer from TensorFlow just to optimize these, these um, circuits. Um, in the case of QAO, the loss function is the average cost that we get um, from the output and we are optimizing um, these parameters. So these angles that I, that I spoke before um, such that um, the loss is minimized, which we want in the end, because the loss in our case is the number, the average number of color changes. Um, now um, for this, I, I'm not going to into detail in this case, but um, this is also one of the reasons why we're very excited about this application is that we can actually get rid of this outer um, optimization loop. And that um, uh, is, is basically due to work we did before. So if um, your problem graph has some um, characteristics and namely if it is regular and all the interactions are of magnitude one, you can actually guess these um, very good parameters. So they are near to optimal parameters in this case. And this, again, as you can imagine, um, substantially speeds up this algorithm. If you don't have to have these, these optimization, auto-optimization, you can just start uh, running and getting uh, results right away. And um, so uh, now the conundrum we are actually in is um, we want to, um, find out the performance of this algorithm without even executing it. Because in the end, um, we want to know how would this algorithm perform on a um, perfectly unitary, so fully error corrected QPU uh, with, with an infinite size QPU actually. And um, as you can imagine, this, this cannot be done on current hardware because current hardware is not error corrected and also far away from being of infinite size. And so how can we do that? So I, I'm trying to, to uh, explain it a little bit. So um, as I said, so this, this loss function, which is the average performance is defined over a sum of these rules. And these rules are basically combined according to if this is a ferromagnetic interaction or a anti-ferromagnetic interaction. But let's consider just one of these um, rules. And let's say this rule involves um, this qubit and this qubit. And you can think about which of these gates that all are in this quantum algorithm actually affect this, the average outcome of this. And you can basically identify a set of, of these gates that really affect the average performance of this. And interestingly enough, because all of this is unitary, you can basically um, get rid of all of these gates if you're only interested in the average performance of one of these rules. And if we are, again, looking at a, um, looking at this in the, in the problem graph picture, we can identify starting from, from this specific rule, a subgraph of the entire graph that, we, that um, it suffices to simulate only on this subgraph. And we're using this feature to um, calculate um, the average performance of QAOA from um, roughly five to 100 qubits. And this is something which, um, if you were to really simulate a QPU, you would never uh, have gotten up to 100 cars. Um, but with this trick, we can actually um, calculate the average performance. And so what you see here is, um, again, so this is on the x-axis is the number of cars and we characterize the, the, the performance by the average number of color changes. And here in this plot, you see um, the greedy algorithm and um, different versions of the QAOA algorithm. So this is a P equals one would be a level one QAOA up to a um, level five QAOA. And we also have um, some data on the optimal solution. And um, what you can see is basically the average performance is basically linear for all of these algorithms for the greedy as well. And for the greedy is it's, it's actually proven already. And um, for QAOA it's conjecture. Um, now in the inset, you can actually see here, here or uh, if, if you look very closely, you can see that um, we can beat the greedy algorithm starting with um, P equals four. 
But this is this is results only for finite n. So can we also say something for the infinite um, range scaling? And for this, it's interesting to look at the following um, um, thought experiment, basically. So consider a regular graph. And in this case, I took actually a three regular graph um, because it's it's just easier to understand that way. So in our case, it would be a four regular graph, but the reason is basically the same. So um, you're looking at a four, uh, a three regular problem graph, and you're trying to find out um, what are the possibilities for the support of these reverse causal cones. So what are the, the possible possible configurations that I have to simulate? Um, if I'm interested in these, um, in the average performance of these uh, local rules, basically. And um, for a three regular graph, you basically only have three of these uh, possible subgraphs. And the interesting thing now is um, you can do some statistics and um, you um, can find out actually analytically that this, uh, the probability for this tree graph here. Um, um, approaches one when this uh, this entire problem graph um, goes to infinity. So um, the number of nodes goes to infinity. You can actually show that the, the most likely subgraph by far and actually the, the only subgraph you have to look at is the tree subgraph. And um, what this basically says is we can calculate the, um, the in the limit of infinite system size, we can calculate the QAO performance just by calculating um, this, this tree graph. And that, is, um, and, and that is an interesting thing because um, as an as a um, technique to, to simulate that, we are using tensor networks. So like um, William was uh, introducing a talk before mine. And that is interesting, yeah, because I never thought that this would show up in, in, a, in another application, actually in an application beyond simulating quantum circuits. And um, so we are doing that. And we can actually um, extract from that the infinite size performance. And that, that is what you see here. So this is um, the average number of color changes. Here is the average number of color changes um, per car. Um, for QAOE, example, for and for example, here in level one QAOE, and you can beat. Uh, you can actually show that um, with level one, you can beat uh, random guessing, and um, with level four, you can beat the greedy algorithm, and with level seven, you can beat um, the recursive greedy algorithm. And this is really exciting for us because in the end, this means that we can. Um, reduce a polynomial runtime where we can can get on average better results uh, with a constant runtime um, compared to um, heuristics that have been specifically developed for the problem um, with a polynomial runtime. And um, by now I hope <laughs> you are very psyched about that. And, and now we need to, to look a little bit at what is possible actually today. So what, what we did uh, in addition to that, we, we executed um, this kind of problem on a ion trap device, which we accessed um, through AWS uh, bracket or the bracket. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. And um, so these are the results. So what you see here is basically what we did. We uh, generated random instances of this binary potential problem. Um, we execute that on this iron trap computer, and we um, have here the statistics of these results. And we actually do this this this, this um, property delta c is is uh, rescaled performance, and um, delta c if delta c is zero is uh, zero, that would mean that our QPU is behaving like uh, fully error corrected QPU. And uh, delta c equals one means um, the the output of the QPU is not discernible from just a random number generator. Um, and what we can see here is basically uh, from two up to seven um, cars, we get we get some results which are better than random guessing. And then um, here, especially at nine, ten, or eleven cars, which is 
already the, the, the number of uh, qubits in this, this ion trap com uh, computer, um, uh, you, you don't get any more than just random guessing, yeah, basically. Um, another thing that we checked, and which is kind of a cautionary tale, if you really um, if you really want to execute something on a QPU, so we we took the performance um, metrics from uh, this manufacturer of this um, ion trap and set up a um, simulation including the noise. So this is a, basically a simulation that we did with a classical computer, but this classical computer is also simulating the noise. Uh, and the noise levels, the noise strength levels we got from um, the published uh, performance values of the, um, of the hardware manufacturer in this case. And you see there's, there's a big gap. So um, the, the, the noise simulation is much better than, than the actual performance. And this is kind of yeah, a cautionary tale in the end that um, uh, the performance values typically are not an indicator how well the QPU performs on an actual application case. And there's a lot of um, not characterized noise on these uh, QPUs yet that can uh, make the, the, the results much worse. Yeah, with that, I would like to conclude and await your questions. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, talk.